All right. Happy Friday, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to Lama Public Media. My name is Sergio Angelis. I'm the executive director and co-founder. Uh, if you haven't been to Lama Public Media before, we're a creative studio space. So we have different uh, studios here from TV studio to podcasting to audio production, all kinds of equipment. So we teach the community how to leverage media, how to produce it, and then we also help distribute it. Um, so if you want to stick around after this for a tour, uh, just come find myself or Tim. Uh, who's raising his hand in the back. Uh, I'd love to give you a tour. Um, so today, this is the first inaugural Lunch and Learn. Uh, and today, we're going to kick it off with uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we're really grateful for a partnership with the CU Leeds School of Business. Uh, so thank you so much to Ivan and Jeremiah for being here. Uh, and we will also be recording this, so you can watch it again later if you want on our YouTube channel. Um, and we'll kick it off with Ivan introducing himself. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. How about my accent? Good. <laughs> uh, my name is Ivan Portilla. I have been a technologist with a company called IBM for 25 years, IBM Watson. And then I moved to another little company called Microsoft. And at Microsoft, I work on the ChatGPT. Anybody here use ChatGPT? Good. And uh, most recently, I went to work for Rico, but I'm also an adjunct instructor at CU, University of Boulder, in the Applied Math and Computer Science Department. I'm also a researcher at School of Mines, and also a mentor in the Innovation Center here in Lundmont. So I'm going to give the mic to Jeremiah. Well, hello. Thank you guys for making time to come out. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Contreras, and I, let's see, I started off as a CPA, so I've been in business for, for uh, oh, I guess 10 or 15 years, and then I transitioned into teaching, fell into teaching about eight years ago, and I teach right now at CU Boulder at the Leeds School of Business, and let's see, I actually wanted to start off, there's a little podcast introduction, I'm just going to play a quick minute here. We're going to make sure they have access by going to that survey. Okay. So if you haven't signed up to the Wi-Fi, we're going to use it today. And just go to slido.com and put that survey number. And tell us what you think about AI. Just a little survey there. Open the QR code. Make sure you're on Wi-Fi. We're just doing some pre-talk checking there. And then we can see real life what are your impressions about AI. Just to verify if you have access. And I'm hoping for somebody type Terminator or Skynet. <laughs> and then we'll switch. Is that okay? Yeah. Don't be shy. Yeah. So scary. Good. Yeah. Helpful. Breakthrough. Questionable. Oh. Great. Thank you for participating. I just want to make sure you have access to the Wi Fi. View those still. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So now we're going to switch. AI. It's everywhere you look these days, right? Scary. Headlines, social media, everybody's talking about it. That's for sure. But for this deep dive, we're kind of sidestepping the hype and zeroing in on something really cool happening on a local level. Ooh, I like where you're going with this. Local is good. It's all about bringing AI expertise right to our doorstep. We're talking about an event, actually, hosted by Longmont Public Media. And get this, they've got not one, but two AI experts lined up. Ivan Portia and Jeremiah Contreras. Longmont Public Media, huh? Interesting. Yeah, and we're digging into this document we found introducing AI experts Ivan Portia and Jeremiah Contreras at Longmont Public Media, it's called, to give every. So that actually took about two and a half minutes. Had ChatGPT just write a quick press release, uploaded it, and these two AI podcasters just those voices are not real people. We just did it about 20 minutes before we started, and it created this podcast. 
Um, there's a lot of implications. We'll talk about some of those later. Uh, but Yvonne, I guess uh, I'll go ahead and kick it back to you. I'll start these slides up. Yep. Can have the clicker, clicker here. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah. So again, Ivan, talking about AI. I tell my students, you cannot spell Ivan without AI. <laughs> the agenda that we prepare for you is very simple. We're going to take you on a gentle journey, because not everyone has spent 10,000 hours working on AI, like I have. So we're going to go with the principles, some of the terminology, make sure we're on the same page. And then we're going to share some experiences from our careers in business, in education, and engineering. I do a lot of coding for my work as an architect. So I may show you some coding examples. But don't get scared, because it's going to be really simple. And then we will mention some ethical implementations and open it up for uh, demonstration and Q&A. So the first thing that I want to share with you is my definition of AI, artificial intelligence. I usually tell my students that AI is just intelligence demonstrated by machines, right? But then the harder question is, what is intelligence? How would you define intelligence? So think about when you hear the sounds that I'm making, you're associating that voice into thoughts in your brain. Or if you go to a room like this and you recognize someone in the audience, you're recognizing that face, you're doing facial recognition. Or when you're reading a text, you are translating those symbols, picturegrams, into thoughts, into your brain. And those are the areas that we're teaching machines how to do. So that's the kind of intelligence that is being demonstrated by machines. Okay? Think of, of devices to, in daily life that you use that have AI embedded. Anybody here has a smartphone? Right? Or your smart speaker at home? All of those devices are doing that translation of text to speech, speech to text. Or even recently, we have some visual recognition. So some of these devices will greet you when they see you coming into the door. Will say, hey, hi, Ivan, how are you? Then anybody here in social media? Maybe one or two? What you see in social media or what you recognize in social media is being selected by an AI. So all those feeds, all those pictures that you uh, post there, they're being used to train those AIs and give you recommendations. Anybody here doing some online shopping over the holidays? Right? So all those things that you buy, they will try to upsell you other things if you buy a couch try to sell you a chair, you buy a skirt, sell you a blouse. All of that is driven by the AI and the dis different retailers. And then probably kids, very familiar with online gaming. I was part of the team at IBM that worked with uh, Fortnite. It's a big game player. And we helped them develop strategies to defeat it or to engage the, the online users. Many areas of uh, AI that you use every day that you don't realize. Another example that I use in my class is when you make a phone call, a cell phone call, that call gets routed through the network, the carrier network through an AI to find the optimum path so you don't lose that connection. Okay. The three types of terms that we use on AI are artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. And sometimes people use those and don't realize the differences. So again, AI, intelligence demonstrated by machines. That one we know. Now, a little bit of deep learning or machine learning is a subset of AI that we teach the computers with data. We don't program them. We give them a whole bunch of examples, and we tell the machines, learn from these examples, find the patterns, and then answer a question. Make sense? And if you go deeper, then you find deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning that is inspired by the human brain. Anybody here a doctor, medical doctor? 
So the brain, arguably the most complex thing in the universe, is being used to train these AIs. So we use something called neural networks, where we have our layers of neurons connecting to each other, and they are learning about a particular set of data. That is deep learning. And most recently, we start talking about Gen AI. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Here's an exercise that I do with my students. Say that I'm asking you to trade an algorithm using any of those techniques to differentiate between cats and dogs. And all I'm doing is giving you pictures and asking you, how would you trade an AI to do that? So think about that for a minute. You're trying to differentiate A between a cat and a dog. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep, yep. So in my class, we go through things like the shape of the ears or the eyes, the, the shape of the snout, right? Those are the things we will use to train the AI. Some of my students say, well, how about the sounds they make? Could that be used? Yeah, but remember, it's a picture. So then I will have to have a video, which is just a series of pictures with sound that I can use to train my AI. So this is the type of learning that we're doing on AI from data, find patterns in that data, so the AI can answer a question. Is this a cat or a dog? But how about this picture? <laughs> which one is the dog? And which one is the muffin? This one is easy, right? But this one is a little bit harder. That's why we need millions and millions of data points to train our AI. So it, one of my managers at IBM said, AI is not magic. It's all about the data that you have to train your models. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the, the question was, who's putting the ADA into all the different AI companies? And we, the users. Every time that you sign those terms and conditions in Gmail and Facebook and TikTok, you are giving away the right to your data. So the companies are using your data to improve themselves. Right now, there's a big dilemma with all the movies in Hollywood, all that, because the AI possibly will display some jobs, because we're going to be creating the content, the scripts, even the movie co completely by an AI. So we, as users, are voting with our data. You are deciding which company is stronger, why X Twitter is better than other service providers, right? So that's a very important point. If AI is your destination, data is the fuel that is going to get you there. No data, no AI. And we, the users, are providing our data. We just need to be cognitive about that. Very good question. Thank you. Now let's talk about uh, ChatGPT. You say you were users, right? So I was part of the team that put together the Microsoft side of ChatGPT, GPT 3.5. And I call it the ketchup moment. Anybody here been at dinner and have ketchup and you smash in that bottle and nothing comes out and then plop, get a big plop of ketchup. That happened on November 30, 2022, about 8 a.m. when ChatGPT announced uh, ChatGPT to the world. And in five days, they reached 100 million users. In five days. It's one of the quickest technologies adopted in the world, five days to reach 100 million users. My students, because I was in Microsoft, started using it in September of that year. And Jeremiah, too, also had access to the API. So Gen AI, Generative AI, is what ChatGPT is about. And the GPT is important to understand. The chat is just the interface, like a chatbot. You're conversing with a chatbot. But the GPT stands for Generative, Generative AI, P for pre-trained, and T for transformers. And that will be on the quiz. <laughs> Sergio, do we have a quiz? No, OK. So the interesting thing about this definition is the transformers, the architecture behind ChatGPT, 
was developed by Google. But OpenAI created the product. It's what we call innovator's dilemma. The people that create the technology sometimes don't realize the value. And now they're trying to play catch up with Gemini or Bard. Okay. So again, traditional programming, the one that we have done all our lives. Anybody here a programmer? Coder? Excellent. So in traditional programming, you have a goal. You have data and you have the recipe of the algorithm. Say, for example, that I want to calculate payroll for my company. I have the data, how many employees I have, the deductions. I know how to calculate payroll, hours per, per employee, and I can answer a question. What is my payroll this, more, this month? With AI, we switch that around. We still have data. Now we have a goal, but what we don't have is the recipe, the algorithm. A good example of that is, say I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to put my house in the market, but I don't know what is the price, what will be a fair price. So that's my goal. I have data from Zillow and other providers, and I let the AI figure out the algorithm to price my house. So coding, programming has changed a lot with these tools. Run some the data. And with Gen AI, we create new content. And that content can be text, coding, images, and most recently, audio and video. And I just have to jump in here really quick, because when you explained this to me, yeah. that was really a, a, a mind-blowing moment. This was kind of fundamental to understanding. You know, at first, humans have to tell computers exactly what to do. Right? It's like exact instructions, and this is what we want you to do. And then computers started. We, we just gave them a little information, and they started figuring it out on their own. How do I do this on my own? So it's this whole transformative way of computers learning for themselves. And then they continue on to generative AI, which is kind of what we're going to explore for the remainder of this. Yes. Yes. Could you explore that example of the real estate Yes. Sure. So when I calculate my payroll, I know how much you make per hour and what is your deduction for IRS. I know the recipe. I know the algorithm. So it's easy for me to program the answer to what is payroll this month. When I when I calculate the price of my house, I don't know what makes my house more expensive than my neighbors. Is it close community to a school, public transportation? Is it the kitchen remodeling, the basement? I have about 2,000 variables that I don't know which one will help me figure out the price of my house. So, but when I send all that data from my neighbors, from my city, from my state, to the country, to the AI, the AI figure out how to find the price of my house with the data. Correct. But with all those parameters. And they, yeah. You, you will add additional details. You take some pictures, or you will describe your bathroom. Yeah, but it's going to be my house, an approximate value. And that's another good point, that AI is probabilistic. It's not deterministic. And what that means is it gives you an answer, but it gives you a confidence. It's going to say, like, it's going to rain tomorrow, 80% chance. It's sure. With deterministic algorithms, you have $100 in your bank account. You withdraw $10. Tomorrow you'll have 90 for sure. That will be more like traditional programming. OK? Did that answer the question? The question was, how do you explain the AI learning? Any other questions? Going to be switching here topics for more Gen AI, ChatGPT. Yes. Correct. Yep. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yes. So the quality of the AI. Yes. So the question is the quality of the AI predictions based on the quality of your data or your input. And this is how we leverage not just your pictures, but your pictures of your neighbors and the pictures of 
the city and the state. So there's more data than just your data, right? So that's one thing. And then we apply other techniques that we can do during the, the life cycle of the AI project, such as understanding the data, cleaning up the data, and removing all those outliers or those missing data. So one of my colleagues used to say that you become a data janitor. <laughs> you clean up the data until you have good data set to train your model. And my other colleague used to say that if you punish the data long enough, it will confess to anything. <laughs> but that's a very good point. Bad data in, you have a bad prediction. Very good. Any other questions about what we covered so far? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. That's exactly correct. And the question is, I have experience in this example of the selling my house, and when I used to do this human way, we have only about 100, maybe 100 parameters. Now with the AI, we have additional ways to see the hidden data elements. And you never thought that proximity to the schools, or proximity to public transportation, the correct me if I were on, was a factor in your assessment. But now we know that. So the unknowns unknowns. AI has helping us discover what we were missing about that data. And the way that I explain to my student is, say you're a CSI investigator, you arrive to the crime scene, and what is the question you're not asking that is going to solve that case? What you don't know, you don't know. And that's what AI is helping us. Correct. It makes an unknown unknown as a known unknown. And that's why it's so scary, because now we can predict the day of your death, or who's going to be the next president, or who's going to get accepted to college. That's my, my colleague portion of the talk. Yes. Correct. Correct. Right. And that's my second point. So first point that I make early is that you vote with your data. Right? All of you are providing data to these companies. You're voting which company is successful. Now my second point is that you need to be knowledgeable about these terms. You need to learn about AI because now you need to have a voice, a citizen representation that you need to share with your representatives and help regulate these companies. We're not going to let them run the world with AI. We need to have a voice. Very good. Any more questions on the intro before we jump to ChatGPT? OK. So Jeremiah, could you take us here? Absolutely. And yet, you know, the data questions and, and the applicability, like how do you apply it to the real world, so important. And, and at first they thought, you know, let's give it some perfect data, a little bit of perfect data. And it was like, okay, it started to learn. But then they actually figured out, well, let's just give it everything and see what it does. So they gave it everything, good, bad, ugly. And it was just a lot of data. And just like we see a lot of data, if we spend the time, we can start to ferret out and figure out what is relevant, what is not, what are the trends of what's making sense, what pieces fit together. And it's, it's the neural networks of how it's designed almost function kind of how we do. And so, um, so, so it's just a, a lot of data and it starts making the connections, which ties directly into that assessor. How do I value the house? We used to, when we're figuring out, we used to figure out, well, these are the 100 things I think are relevant. But now we just give it everything 
and it's like, oh, what might be relevant? And it starts to find these trends. And then we could test it, right? We can go back and say, wow, they actually found things that I hadn't even thought of. Correct, with the probable, not with certainty, which is still how we're doing it in that scenario. Um, we, you know, that's probabilistic from, from how we're looking at it. So yeah, absolutely. Um, here, should I grab the clicker, clicker? Perfect. So, great questions. So this was, I was gonna pause and ask questions, but we've been, we've been doing some great questions. So based on what you know coming in and, and what we've kind of talked about, I'm just curious about who's below and who's above this line. So we kind of have this fearful area, right? Fearful of AI. And we kind of did a little bit of this in the beginning, but um, you know, maybe skeptical, maybe just curious, excited, hopeful. Who, who thinks they're a little bit below the line? Okay. So there's a little, little bit of me that's there too. Um, who's kind of just in the middle? Curious? Okay. You can be, absolutely. It's not one or the other. This is not mutually exclusive. Absolutely. You keep raising your hand. <laughs> Who's excited and hopeful? Yeah, so and we're, we're getting a good mix, right? Some people that, that maybe are, are, are multiple places. I am all of these sometimes in one day, right? It's like I come into the day and I see something that scares me, and, and then I kind of get curious about it, digging in, and then a little excited, and then hopeful, and then back to fearful, right? All in one day. And so, and, and with the changes of it, it, it's really even hard to know everything about it. It's hard to know enough about it. And so a lot of times we, we end up in these states because of uncertainty. We're not even sure what's happening, how it works, can we trust it? And so, so yeah, so perfectly normal to be in one or more of these at the same time, absolutely. So uh, being in part of the business school, you know, we look at how is AI affecting business. And you know, a lot of what we're trying to do is figure out, well, if the business world is embracing this, incorporating it into their processes, then our students need to learn about it. So we find out what, what is it, right? How is it being used? And so you know, it is being used for data analysis. Uh, JP Morgan, Chase Bank, their analysts have a tool now that is AI that's assisting them. Customer service chatbots. I had a return at Amazon the other day it was the best experience I ever had. <laughs> it understood my needs. It got me to the assistance right away chatting with an AI. Now, if it needed escalation, the AI can make a determination of sending it up to a person. So we have these, you know, the, the, these uh, touch points and, and the fact that we don't need to lose the human in the loop is what they call it. Uh, there should be a human in the loop in certain things for sure because it is probabilistic. It's not perfect in every scenario. Uh, so what about the jobs, right? So, I mean, you know, there, there will be a transition of jobs, um, but just like when the computer came and Excel and, you know, all the technology we had, we thought all the jobs were going to go away. But rather, we, we you know, we, we found innovation in ways to use those. My hope is that that's what happened. And, but if you step back, it is our hopes that are going to drive what happens, right? It's, it's us who, who is going to be a part of that conversation of being part of the regulation, finding out more about it. <laughs> hey, you, you know, what, whatever the tools and mechanisms are, um, th some element. <laughs> I, what's that? Wishful thinking. It, wishful thinking, yeah. And, you know, and, and that's the thing. We, we, have to, we have to dream and think, like, how would I want this to work? Is it going to be that way? No, it's not. But I think, right, if, if we picture what we think, should AI be making decisions that are life and death, right? We need to have an input in that. And if they start doing it, we can raise our voice and, and you know, you, you use our voice and raise our hand and say, hey, we need to make sure there are limits. Now, is that going to solve the problem? I don't know, but. My, my only <clears throat> was about yeah. late, late stage capitalism has effectively neutered regulation. That's all. Right. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we have a lot of things that are, uh, you know, motivation, human-driven motivation. And we ha when we have capitalism, we have profit driving a lot of the aspects. Uh, in my opinion, there's this thing called alignment. And so alignment is getting AI to have our sense of ethics and morals from making sure we're taking care of things and doing things the right way, not solely having a profit motive, 
maybe taking care of people as well along the way. So I think we could potentially use AI to help manage and mitigate the risk of us going too far to profit and help rein us in. Now, that's my wishful thinking, so I'm trying to make it happen. Well, like, yeah, yeah. How do we teach the morality to AI, to the machines? Nobody knows. They're trying to figure it out. Um, they're getting feedback. And I will tell you, it's, it's, it's just like how do you move any big ship when you're not the pilot, right? I mean, can we have an impact on a large carnival cruise right now in the water? Eventually, if there's a big problem, Maybe there's safety concerns and we raise our, you know, say, hey, we need to regulate this industry or help monitor the industry or we need to hold the com company accountable. We're not going to buy from Car Carnival until they fix some things, right? That's how some, it takes a long time, especially when we're not even on the boat, but it can happen. There's a question over here. Oh, yeah. yeah. I also want to add to that question because with my students, I tell them, you are my AI ambassadors. So all of you are going to represent me next time you talk about this topic with your friends and family, that you have a knowledge. So you've been educating yourself to gain this understanding that you are driving the adoption of these technologies. So education is one, right? Your data, you're voting with your data. And then when you express those concerns, they will trickle up to the decision makers. Right now, there are two models in the world, the European model and the US model. European model is highly regulated. You cannot go anywhere in European websites without seeing that GDPR warning, cookies, and so on. So it's, it's different innovation. They are controlling too much. In the US side, we open it up to whatever Sam Altman wants to do with OpenAI. So it's too much innovation in certain things like autonomous weapons that we need to be concerned about, machines killing humans without any human intervention, those drones and so on. So we need to find a happy medium that we need to regulate that AI. And for ethical AI, there's a whole presentation after this, if you can write us back. Yes, sir. Lobbyists, money. Correct. Correct. That is correct. 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 So the points where the balance of power, who is driving this governance, these policies, is in the hands of very few now savvy politicians, and then the sustainable AI. I may disagree, but we. we but in general, that's why I am doing my piece. I'm teaching a high school and college. I'm going to ask you to do your piece and help explain that AI is not magic. Correct. 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 Yes. Yes. Correct. But we have had an office of AI. cannot predict the future. But for this talk, if you take a message back 
and saying, we went to our AI talk, we understand the principles, AI is not magic, it depends on the data you're fed into the models, then we are in making a right direction, going in the right direction of changing policies. Sustainable AI is another one that I wanna bring up here. There is not gonna be a GPT-10, because by that time we will consume all the Earth's resources, right? So we need to change how these models are trained. So that's another thing that we need to worry about. We cannot keep going exponential in these technologies because we are using the data centers, the cooling and all that. So it's an interesting fact, but let's get us here through the chat GPT portion and we can come back on Q&A. Sounds like a plan? Perfect. No, I mean, great, great points. And, and I think that those are the conversations we need to have, right? And so, um, and, and an element is, right, we started education as well. We do have the conversations along the way. Um, jobs will change. And I think that's kind of the, what we've determined is jobs have changed and are changing. And so there are jobs out there that are paying to start 250 to $350,000 for someone who can prompt well. And so, um, not code, right? Not not uh, perform accounting calculations, but just prompt. And so, uh, th this is a changing world. That's just a taste, but um, we need to be ready for that. Uh, and we, you know, hopefully, part of the conversation. But it starts with knowledge. So we're going to figure out some pros and cons um, at Leeds and in computer science. Uh, you're part of the computer science division. Uh, we are integrating AI into our classes at the business school. And so we're, we have a, a concerted effort, coordinated effort, to make sure all of our students early on get some education. How to use it, the ethics behind it, the biases that are built into it. So what's happening is you know, pe students are learning in middle school or high school how to take the shortcut, path of least resistance. I probably would have been guilty when I was that age. And so what's going to happen is we have these students coming in to higher ed, and even we need to do it in K through 12 is to show people the proper way to use AI, which is more of a collaborative approach than allowing it to think for ourselves. If we let it think for ourselves, it will take over. When we use it collaboratively and make sure we keep the human in the loop, that's where I think we can have success. And so that's what we're working towards, um, making sure, and we're partnering with industry and, and you know, making sure we have a pulse on what companies need from students and make sure that we're aware of, of how we can support that. Uh, AI for everyone. So how can just, you know, if, I'm, if we're not in business or, you know, how could I just use it in my day to day? So what are some ways you guys do use it? Several of you, you know, use it. Most of you, it sounds like, yeah. Okay, coding assistant. Pre-visualization, okay, okay, okay. Right. A amazing. So, so, so I, I use a social media called Nextdoor. And sometimes I get into arguments. So <laughs> I'll put my comment up, and then I'll copy and paste it into AI and say, can you say this nicely? That was you. That was you. <laughs> right, right. Can you say this nicely? <laughs> Right, right. So you have this awareness of, I have this ability to maybe jump in a little too much with too much emotion and maybe say some hit send before I should. Sure. And now you've started to say, hey, help me have a dialogue rather than commanding barking. Have you noticed that now your initial thoughts are changing? Is it helping you become better at the way you think? Yeah, yeah, because I, I kept getting suspended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we, we learn from each other and we learn from people we respect or things that we respect. We model if someone is modeling behavior. And it can do a good job of modeling some behavior, of interaction. And so, you know, when I work in the classroom with my students, 
I'm like, my job isn't to teach you to talk to AI all day long. It's to utilize AI so we can have deeper conversations with each other and we can communicate in a better way. So that, that's the ultimate goal that, that we try, one of them. Do you have a comment? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely, the importance of having positive uh, influence on how this works. Absolutely, right, and that's part of what we're doing, right? And so, and and and, but an actual, absolutely. So, how could I use it? Um, recipe suggestions, right? Someone's coming over to my house. They're a uh, what? A vegan? What is that? So, if I don't know what to do, right? How can I prepare a meal for someone who's a vegan? We were planning on chicken and pasta, but you know, what could I do to change it? It can give great advice, uh, personalized workout plans. I'm, you know, this is where I'm at. I've talked to my doctor. I'm trying to do this, and it can give some advice and actually set out a, a plan that can help me stay motivated and ease into a workout plan. Uh, am I looking for a job? Maybe. Actually, I'm not. But uh, resume and cover letter assistance. Now, risk. Some students are just saying, "Here's the job description. Give me a cover letter and a resume to go with this." It will give you something that matches and says you have the skills. So we need to make sure that we know we have to tell it our abilities and then say, match my abilities to this job in the best way you can. Do not add anything. We have to add that. Otherwise, it's going to try to please us. It wants to please us, and it can make up things. It can also fabricate facts as well. They call that hallucination. And so there, there are a lot of pitfalls that we have to be aware of, too. It can tell us things that aren't true. Uh, and a whole lot more. Yeah. I would make a comment that I, I think the word confabulation in the description of what it does is hallucination. Confabulation as opposed to hallucination. It's, like, it's a neuroscience term for people who have various disabilities and are asked a question and they know they should know the answer, but they actually don't know exactly what the answer is. So what they do is they make something up. Right. And, and so uh, that's what AI does in a lot of cases. It can fabulate. It sounds really good sounds and authoritative, good. exactly. And yes. That, and that dovetails in to a point of my head. So oftentimes we're on the edge of knowledge. And we like to use tools to help us you know, get beyond that edge. So let's say we talk in a very complex problem. And what comes back? Since whatever he's trying to do is unprecedented, you're working off of a prediction. So 
So, so if I'm an engineer and I get advice and it has a probability of success and then I build a bridge and it falls down, that's a problem. <clears throat> right. Right. And when, when we have it being decided by a black box, we don't know how it's done. That is challenging. Right, right. Oh. Yes, question? Let me set this up here. Right. If I walk outside right now and there's a police officer standing and says, you need to move this way, I will probably go that way. Now, is that police officer real? Are they, I mean, there's a lot to it. Part of it is we give things authority. So it's how much authority do we give it? And that is also why we're here. It's up to us to determine how much authority am I going to allow this thing to, to take from me, right? So, um, so we're going to do a quick little exercise. I want to get you guys on, but uh, we are running out of time. So... Uh, I think we could probably even stick around a little later if people want a little more hands-on. Uh, so what could it do? Uh, we'll jump in and do some examples, but what if we're going to start a small business? And I want help brainstorming some ideas, putting together some plans. Um, we can do coding. We might skip through an example. Um, we can create an image. So I'm going to pull up ChatGPT, which there are multiple LLMs, large language models. There's multiple tools. ChatGPT is just one of them. But is it Chrome? Yeah. Claude, Gemini. I have the mess. Double click. Uh, this thing here. I, I'm a PC, not a Mac user. <clears throat> okay. Perfect. So, real quick, let's just come up with an idea. What business do we want to start? Something simple. What business might we want to start? Bakery. I love it. Okay. Okay, bakery. What do we want to do? Who are we going to sell to? Are we going to be a small neighborhood? Are we going to be in a populated area? Okay, micro bakery. Okay, so hopefully that doesn't fall. I'll try to catch it. So I could just type, I want to start a bakery. <laughs> that exciting defined concept. So it actually tells me some things I should do. Um, but, you know, it doesn't know a lot of context about me, who I am. Uh, but it tells me some things to think of. But, you know, another way I could even start is I have never owned a business. I'm going to give it some context about me. I live in Colorado. Wrong not. Um, that's not the right order, but it'll know. Um, and I want to start a micro bakery. Where should I begin? Walk me through some bullets. Oh, perfect. So understanding the details about micro bar uh, bakeries, niche product selection, it's going to be a little more specific to who I am and what I need. Okay, so it's kind of tailoring it. So part of prompting is the more information we can give it, a little background about us, the better it's going to do. Regulation, check your local rules. It knows, you know, oh, I'm looking at this place. So, you know, it's going to give me some feedback. I want to look into permits and licensing. I could, you know, I could ask it, how do I check permits and licensing? Do I find permits and licenses? Colorado Department of Health. It's going to even give me a link here now. So this is... Um, 
we're not going to click that. So it'll give me a link and I can go to the website. And they are getting more accurate. They used to be false links and, and fake. But so a lot more hand holding. So now that I am just someone who has a dream of a bakery, even though I have no business skills, I can now gain assistance at following my dream and you know, uh, living out my passion. So it can be a partner, but I'm not going to tell me how to run it or everything, but it can brainstorm ideas and I can go back and forth. Yes? Okay, false, it's giving me a false sense of security. I want my dream. I'm going to keep my dream. There are doubters my whole life, and I'm going to move forward. It's, it's probably not going to do a great job. And so there are certain things that, well, yeah, what is probability? Yvonne, don't get mad at me. Probability for success. Um, if I follow these bullets. Depends on a range of factors, including your dedication. Oh. Boom, right there. So market demand, how well you follow the plan. Uh, it's hard to get an exact number. I can share some points. So it's actually not even going to just tell me, you got this, you're going to do it. There is a lot to it. I have to stay motivated. There is luck involved. It, you know, I, could, and I can have that conversation back and forth. Yes? You know, if you're Right, a false sense of, hum uh, of, of confidence, or is it just a partner, an assistant, a collaborator that's going to help me along my journey, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Correct. They're going back and forth. ChatGPT just released a new model called 401. And they're calling it next step. They're calling it human level intelligence. It can think through, it, it can think through a problem in 30, 40 seconds. It takes its time. It does what's called a chain of thought reasoning. So it goes through and it says, OK, I'm going to think about it this way. Then I'll look at it this way. And it kind of has an internal dialogue back and forth of what's a logical way to address this. It's, it's, it's processing a bunch of information, and then it gives the result of a well thought out answer. And it's exceeding PhD level responses to um, bio, biology questions, uh, physics. It's, it's answering legal questions much better, scoring better on my accounting exams. It's getting questions it couldn't get before. And so they're becoming more and more capable. It's not a computer. It's not Excel. Those are tools that do what we tell them. It's this agentic. It's an agent that starts doing things on its own. And it's getting closer to being able to do that. So yes, there, 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 is, there is a change. But um, I'm not so better tool. Jim and I, I like some of the, the writing style. But that's Google's product. Maybe they have better uh, access to my emails or the way people write. I'm not sure. But again, who's giving it the data? Where are they giving it from? There was a question over here. Yeah. Right. So I don't, I'm, not, I'm not assuaged by hearing that you're getting PhD level answers because I've gotten a lot of bad answers from PhDs. Yes. Learning experience. Right. So it, 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 how can you say it, it's better than people? Which people? That does matter. And I actually probably misspoke. PhD students, I think, on certain exam type questions. Scale. Yeah. It, it is uh, leaps and bounds beyond what it was able to do sure, yeah. a month ago. So, yeah.
here, you know, because we uh, use API, well, actually, it's machine learning to isolate the voice and, and to do some prediction. But the result was pretty, uh, pretty dead, I thought. We didn't have a real collaboration. You had a facsimile of a collaboration. And it's been, it was really interesting talking to the users this month. You know, what did you think of that new? Right. Uh, real quick, we are actually at time. It is one o'clock. Do we, do we have the room longer if people want to stay? Okay. So, uh, yes. So um, why don't we why don't we do this? If anyone needs to exit, you're welcome to. Otherwise, we can get you guys exploring and doing some some chatting. Does that sound good? Dive right into that. Perfect. Yes, and so um, what we're going to do there, there are, and kind of as I was explaining, just asking a simple question is, it, it needs to be a little more. We need to give it some context of who are we, what am I looking for, and then maybe even what kind of output do I want? One or two paragraphs, some bullet points. Otherwise, it'll drone on and on, kind of like we are. So um, here's...